Hello. Uh, yeah, it's lovely to be presenting at the SCDC, and especially at such a historic venue at the Royal Geographic Society. So the presentation is titled Natural Language Processing for GIS. Uh, so you might be thinking, why am I discuss discussing natural language in a spatial data science conference? But as you will see, it is very relevant. And the interesting thing is they both have very similar origins. I'm sure you've heard of Tobler's first law of geography. Everything is related to everything else but near things are more related than distant things. Well, NLP also has a very similar foundation. A word is characterized by the company it keeps. Before we begin the presentation, let me quickly give you an introduction to myself and my company. So uh, I'm Tussel, my background is in the natural sciences and computer science. I did a master's and then went into consulting. It's a very traditional uh, path, uh, but then there I learned uh, to use natural language processing algorithms, not just to solve linguistic problems for my clients, but also adjacent areas like recommended system design. I then went to the UK Health Security Agency to work on the government's COVID response. I led a small team of computer scientists, mathematicians, and biologists to create spatial epidemiological models uh, to, to predict the spread of COVID. I then moved towards my current company, Knight Frank, uh, where uh, I'm developing a spatial data science capability at the intersection of traditional data science and geospatial. And together with my colleagues, we've modeled almost every aspect of the UK's geography, its economy, and its social demography. So, Knight Frank, what is it? We are a global property consultancy. Uh, we operate in over 50 territories. We handle almost a trillion dollars of real estate annually within the commercial, uh, residential, and agricultural domains. And the plot of this presentation begins right here, when I was uh, asked to co-author our company's uh, flagship research products called The Wealth Report. And The Wealth Report is actually a thought leader in its industry. It tries to give perspectives on prime property and cross-border investment. So as you can see in the table behind me, we run a client attitude survey where we try to take stock of the attitudes our clients have uh, towards renting, for example, renting their properties or buying new properties in the current year, and also their decision-making uh, kind of attitudes towards the, the destinations of, of their investments. I mean, as we can see, the UK is represented in the top three across all our client geographies. And this is hardly a surprise when you look around London. So the big question that we had this year in the Wealth Report was, could we get a more granular understanding of property ownership? And we decided to use Airbnb data to get a quantitative answer to this business question. And I think in the audience, we, we've all probably used one of these platforms and we're all aware of what kind of data this involves. But just to quickly give an introduction, so imagine you're booking a holiday in Mallorca. So you've got the, the traditional things. You've got a title, you've got a price, you've got some description of what it is. But you also have a description of the host. You can see where they live and a short description of their activities. So this host lives in the US Virgin Islands and enjoys sailing and snorkeling. And of course, because we're living in someone's house, we tend to do some research on the host. Uh, so so th this description can be really interesting for us we can actually pull out geographic entities. And you can see that even though the property that we're interested in kind of uh, in visiting is in Mallorca, the host is actually living in the US Virgin Islands. And after you do more research into the host, you find that they also own a chalet in Verbier. So you can kind of see from this example straight away how valuable the Airbnb data source is to understand foreign global property interests. And we did the very natural thing of acquiring millions of data points from short-term rental platforms like Airbnb and Verbo. And it's very difficult to visualize what uh, kind, of, kind of what a million data points looks like, but we've tried to do it here. So this is probably a very novel image for you. This is the listing data for Airbnb and Verbo visualized across the European continent. And the way we've visualized it is we've taken uh, we've aggregated those, those listings at the pixel level, and the brightness of the pixel corresponds to the number of listings. So you can really see a lot of trends in this. You can see the coastline of Europe, 
uh, completely lit up, uh, the, the demand for that geography is being met by a supply of short-term listings. You can pick out so many trends. Mallorca, where we're we gonna go see, see before, the south of France, it's, it's, completely, it's completely lit up. You can even pick out individual Greek islands or individual ski resorts uh, in, the, in the Alps. We can also see the metropolitan centers of Europe lit up. You can see Paris and you can see London where we are. And let's zoom into London. And if we zoom into London, we can actually see the outline of the Thames. And, and this is just from the actual raw data itself. We can see the, the great parks of London, Regent's Park and Hyde Park, just, just above from where we are right now at the RGS. So it's, it's a very interesting data source and it's very interesting to visualize. But what we actually care about is the text data. And so each of those pixels has multiple listings. And each of, each of those pixels tells multiple stories of migration and international cross-border foreign property investment. So this is exactly what we want to do. We want to tell stories like this. We want to pull them out. We want to, uh, we want to analyze stories like the Parisian couple with three older children who actually are, are letting out a, a listing in the south of France or the Florentine businessman who has a property in Switzerland. But we want to do this across the millions of data points we've collected. And, and I'm gonna give you that image right here. We've, we've done it and this is what it looks like. I'm paying more close attention to the domestic flows. We can see a very strong link between the capitals of each country and its coastline. This is very clear in the case of Athens and Greece and, and Paris and France. We can also see international trends. You can see all of the lines coming out of London across, going across the, the, the European geography. And we have the same data set across the world. But I'm not here to show you uh, pretty images that, that we've created. We actually want to understand how we did it and to draw lessons from what we've done. So it's, it's obvious that we've created a very granular description of property interests, perhaps the most granular in our industry and perhaps the only, only other entity that can create a more granular description is Airbnb itself. So this data, it's a very powerful resource. It's already being used by Knight Frank, not just to solve the business problem of, of better consulting for our clients. Uh, it's used to strengthen our global network, and it's also being used at the executive level for decisions on our global expansion. And you can see how powerful uh, the, that, that technology is. Uh, in, in affecting uh, change for a company. And this data also has broad societal implications. You can imagine the value that this data would have for a public uh, researcher who, who's interested in student migrations in the UK or affordable housing in London. Even though this data set that we've compiled is not ours to open source, we believe that sharing the methods and technologies that we've developed is actually very beneficial uh, and, and in the in, in interests of the public. Yes, so this is a keynote presentation. So it's not, a, it's not a technical deep dive. I only have 15 minutes to tell you why this is important. So I'm gonna actually go through the technical side, but in a very uh, uh, high level way. And, and I'm sure later on we can have a longer discussion. I'm sure uh, maybe the Spatial Data Science Conference will put this on YouTube with a with a little with a little kind of a thumbnail that can link onto the, onto the technical presentation. But here are some tips on how we did this. The tip number one is pay very close attention to your data set. You know, our data set is uh, listings information. We have over a billion words. It's a very large data set, and it's very difficult to understand what that looks like. So imagine printing that out on something like the wealth report and then stacking it up and then stacking it up and it would actually reach the height of the Eiffel Tower. That's how big the data set is. And the other thing is uh, we probably need a gazetteer to geocode once we've extracted the, the, the geographic entities. And the gazetteer that we chose was based on open street map names. We want towns, cities, countries, for, for your data sources, this may be different. So for example, we've heard, we've heard a lot about POI information earlier. Uh, perhaps maybe you can use their services if, if that's the kind of data that you want, if you want vernacular names. So the high level methodology that we used um, is, is very difficult to explain, but I'll try to sum it up. There is of course the control F methodology, which is what you're all probably thinking about. Just take a word in the gazetteer and search across my data set. 
well, we have a billion, we have a billion uh, uh, words, we have you know, 10 million uh, kind of gazetteer entries. If we do a naive search, that's 10 quadrillion comparisons, we'd be here for days, and it's just not scalable enough. So we need a better way. And the thing is, what if there are misspellings in your gazetteer? We probably need to do a fuzzy search. And it turns out fuzzy matching is even a more difficult problem because even though it has the same kind of poor exponential scaling as search, uh, for example, a Levenstein-based fuzzy match has such a large memory requirement that you'd probably brick your laptop within the first five minutes of running this operation. So we really need to get down and understand NLP at a deep level to approach this. So there is also the naive way of doing NLP, which is kind of loading it up into a popular library like Spacey. And, and th that's actually probably not a great way to go here either because our data set is so large. So I have to caveat myself in saying that there is limits to that as well. The way we actually solved this was a mixture of those two approaches. We realized that we have to exploit the structure of our data set to break it down into smaller, more manageable sections to, to, to kind of geopass. And the way that we did that was we realized we needed extremely fast search. So we re-engineered search using an a-hole chorusic uh, string search and a tri-dictionary. And we'll be open sourcing this method later. We also realized we needed fast fuzzy matching and we used technologies from NLP uh, to, to, to make a fast fuzzy matching. We, we created a fast fuzzy matching using creating n-grams, applying a word embedding or a TFID on it at TFIDF on it, and then using approximate nearest neighbors. And these technologies might sound novel to, to some members of the audience, but I think they're really worth trying to understand. Uh, there, there is actually a, a lot here, and it's actually very useful. It's very difficult for me to give you a broad overview of natural language processing in one slide, but I'll try to do that. I think the overarching arc of natural language processing is going from very high dimensional and sparse representations of language to a low dimensional and dense representation. I think the most interesting and important algorithm for you to take away from the slide is word to vec which really began the process of creating word embeddings. We can extend this methodology and, uh, on our data set. We, we can extend it to, to do topic modeling. We can extend it to even do spatial embeddings, which is a whole new class of spatial analysis that we have even yet to, yet to begin looking at as an industry. Uh, another important class of algorithm are called the transformers. Uh, they're, they're, they have, they've got a funny name, but they've actually revolutionized not just natural language processing, but the entire machine learning and AI world. And if you follow updates from DeepMind or, or OpenAI, most of the coolest models that are, that are coming out these days are based on transformers. So I've given you a lot of information so what can we do with it? Well, as we said, I'm going to open source uh, some of the tools that have helped us to solve this problem, but I want you to try to understand NLP yourself and to try to, try to apply these methods uh, on a data set that's similar to ours. There's actually a free data set of Airbnb listings uh, that's, that's available on the internet, and I'm going to put that onto Kaggle so that we have one uh, single source where we can all attempt to solve this problem, and within three months, I'll, I'll keep open sourcing some of our technologies to do that. And you can follow my updates on both LinkedIn and GitHub. Uh, so my, my, my username is just Dussel across all of these, all of these kind of uh, platforms. So it's, it should be quite easy to follow me. Um, yeah, thank you all for listening. And I hope it's been, I hope it's been interesting. Uh, any questions for Dussel? Really interesting use case that perhaps we weren't expecting coming to this today. I think we've got a question over here. Yes. Yes. Just take the microphone back. <laughs> Thanks for the speech. Um, I was. I did not understand. How did you get the data? Is it a Kaggle data set? So the, beginning, the data set that we acquired was was paid data. Um, if you're a researcher, you might you might go uh, a kind of a scraping route, but that's definitely not the route that we took. So I didn't get the answer. <laughs> we, we we paid for the data. Oh, okay. To to uh, to Airbnb. Uh, to uh, a company that works with Airbnb. It's okay. a licensed data set. Okay. And how do you manage the the, 
the legacy of uh, managing uh, personal data about people. On, uh, Obviously, there are a lot of privacy concerns, so we have to take that into account in all of our analysis. We have to limit who has access to the, the PII, and there are only a certain number of uh, individual contributors who are even allowed to look at that kind of thing. Um, definitely, that exists. Um, but that PII is also there in the public data set, and it's there for the world to see. Yes. Your kind of connectivity map was really interesting to see. Yeah, thank you. There wasn't much in that from Germany, you know, as much further Western Europe particularly. Is there some effect of yes. Airbnb use or language or what's going on there? Right, so no, that's a very interesting question. So we had, we had so much data and, and we're actually only looking at a slice of the market. So the kind of market that Knight Frank is interested in is kind of the prime rental kind of, uh, say 250 a night plus. So in Europe, that's the trend that we see, the distribution of, of that kind of uh, price range is, is, is what you saw there. And, and that's why Germany wasn't represented there. Thought it was a terrific talk, thank you for that. Um, thank you. Building on the previous question, in terms of um, the user base of something like Verbo or Airbnb, did you have to make any sort of adjustment biases? Like, are you getting? Oh, yes, <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, yeah, this this is very interesting because we're only going by what someone says in natural language, right? So if you're if you're a, a, a kind of an international student or someone who's who's living and in, in, in renting in London, for example, you, you might just call yourself a Londoner, and and then we lose a whole whole bunch of the market. But what we're trying to do is to create an approximation of, of interest, and, and for that use case, for that business use case, it seemed it seemed like a, a good fit. And also, if I can sneak another one in, how fast did you get when you were um, oh, tr yes. trying to? Oh um, yes. Well, that, that, that's a that's a topic for my technical talk. <laughs> Definitely, yes, to, to be continued. <laughs> Any more questions? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've been a great audience. Thank <laughs> you.